So without any further ado, um, I want to thank you, Susan, and please go ahead. Thank you, Julie.
So this is kind of an interesting timing for us to have this uh, presentation right now because Monday is August 7th, which is National Lighthouse Day. And, what, and August 7th is when we remember the ninth act of the very first Congress in 1789, when um, Congress approved an act for the establishment and support of lighthouses, buoys, and public piers. So before that, all of the lighthouses were kind of um, controlled by the individual states, and there wasn't really any federal oversight. And they also charged, customs collectors charged people when they came into port, charged them for the use of the lighthouse. And um, the Secretary of the Treasury at the time, who was Alexander Hamilton, told President Washington that he didn't think it was right that people should have to pay for lighthouses. He thought that they should be public, just like the air and the water. And so this act that, uh, that established lighthouses being part of the federal government, um, it was actually the, the first public works program in the United States. And it was actually passed before Congress um, <coughs> determined how they were going to get paid. So it was pretty important. And lighthouse law should be remembered as an altruistic act of the nation, the first public <coughs> program undertaken by our new government. So that's August 7th that we celebrate as National Lighthouse Day. So back then in, in 1789, all major decisions, like where we're going to put a lighthouse, who's going to be the keeper, um, spending extra money, construction contracts, those were all made at the federal level after 1789 with the direct involvement of President Washington and his Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. So this speaks to both the small size of federal government back then. I mean, Washington was actually writing letters to lighthouse keepers and telling them what they could and couldn't do. So it, it shows you how much smaller the government was, but also <coughs> how very important lighthouses were in our country. Right. So then the um, responsibility for lighthouses kind of bounced back and forth between the Commission of Revenue, Treasury Department Revenue, and then in 1820, back to Treasury, and this was a really important time, this 1820 to 1852, and I'm going to talk about that in a lot more detail later on. 1852, things got a lot more formalized. Um, the Lighthouse Board was created by that time. We had 325 lighthouses in the country, and something had to be done to create the U.S. Light, Lighthouse Board. That lasted until 1903 a little bit of back and forth, and then in 1939, all the lighthouses were turned over to the U.S. Coast Guard. And at that time, if you were a lighthouse keeper, you could decide if you wanted to enlist in the Coast Guard or if you wanted to stay and be a private keeper, and so it was kind of about half and half when that change happened. And so, um, so just a, a briefly the overview of, um, of our local lighthouses. So 1797, we had um, Highland Light, which of course when it was built was called Cape Cod Light because it was the only lighthouse in Cape Cod. So you'll see it known as Cape Cod Light or Highland Light. It was built in 1797 and it was authorized by President George Washington. And it was in Truro, which for those of you who might not be local, is about 15 miles north of here. So then in 1808, they decided they needed a lighthouse in Chatham, about 15 miles south and they decided that they were going to build two lighthouses in Chatham. And then in 1838, we got the lights here in East Ham. So again, I'll go into a lot more detail about that in a few minutes. Um, so here's an early picture of, of Highland Light and Truro. And what's interesting is it started out, it was going to be a flashing light. So not, not a lot of people are aware of this, but um, they had a very rudimentary technology to use what they called an eclipser, which was a, a disc that went around the light and so obscured the light as it went around and caused the light to appear to flash. But the technology was not very reliable and it turned out to be more trouble than it was worth and so they just changed uh, Highland Light to a single steady white light. 1808 Chatham lights. These, this is actually a picture of the 1841 Chatham lights. Uh, I couldn't find a picture anywhere of the original 1808 lights, but there were two lights in Chatham. And of course, the reason for having two lights in Chatham was if you've got one light in Truro, two lights in Chatham, then the sailors who are out to sea would know that if they see one light, 
they're looking at Truro. If they see two lights, they're looking at Chatham. So again, not really relying on any kind of a flashing technology or different color lights like we do today, but relying on multiple lights to distinguish between different, um, different light stations. All right, so we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Stephen Pleasanton, who was the fifth auditor of the Treasury. Um, uh, it may be hard to know where I'm going with this, but you'll, you'll see the connection in a little while. So uh, Stephen Pleasanton started out his career in the Department of State. And in 1814, when he was working in the State Department, he was instrumental in saving some important documents of the country, including the Declaration of Independence. So in 1814, we're in the midst of the War of 1812. The British were coming to Washington. And um, Pleasanton was afraid that they would, um, that some of the documents would be lost. So he took the Declaration of Independence and various other documents, um, sewed up some uh, fabric bags, and took them uh, off site away from, from Washington, D.C. The next morning he woke up and found out that the Capitol had been burned. So he was successful in, in saving those documents by locking them in an unused farmhouse. Um, so kind of as a thank you for that, um, President Monroe, when he came to power, appointed Pleasanton to be the fifth auditor of the Treasury. And he had uh, many different um, duties at the time, but in 1820 he was appointed superintendent of the lighthouses. Now Stephen Pleasanton didn't really know anything about lighthouses. He didn't have any maritime experience. He didn't know anything about engineering. He didn't know anything about building. His chief purpose in life was to return as much money as possible back to the treasury. He was very much a penny pinching guy. He took a lot of uh, pride in the fact that, that he was always returning money to the treasury. So that was, was his thing. So when it came to lighthouses, Pleasanton relied on the customs collectors. So each port had a customs collector, and they were kind of like the local lighthouse overseers. And he also relied on the contractors who, who did the various lighthouse work. So, um, so the way it, it worked in the Treasury of Lighthouses was Congress would decide that there should be a lighthouse. And then Pleasanton would, would send the design and the plans to the customs collectors and get bids for the lighthouses and then someone would build the lighthouses. So as I said, he didn't really know what he was doing when it came to lighthouses. but Luckily for him, there was a man named Winslow Lewis who helped him out. So Winslow Lewis was born in Wellfleet. He was a sea captain, and he would sail between Boston and Liverpool and you know trade coal, uh, various other items. And so that was his business. Was was he went back and forth um, shipping. Uh, so that worked out really well until 1807 when President Jefferson imposed an embargo on shipping. So the United States was unhappy with Britain and France over the Napoleonic Wars, so they decided that um, no ships could come to America and no American ships could go to Britain and France. So Winslow Lewis was out of a job and had a family to feed. So he turned his attention to lighthouses. He, um, Probably when he was in England, he uh, discovered this lamp that was being heavily used in Europe, and it was invented by a man named Argand. And this is the, the, basically the lamp on the left. And uh, what it was, was an oil lamp with a chimney, and then behind the lamp a reflector to reflect the light, and then in front of it a lens which was supposed to um, make the light brighter, focus the light. So. Um, so Lewis patented this lamp. He really kind of stole the idea. He said he invented it, but he really didn't. But in, in any event, he got a patent for it. And his patent included this sort of chandelier array that you see here. And what this did was he would have, in every lighthouse that had a Lewis lamp, there would be anywhere from six to as many as 24 of these oil lamps on this chandelier so that because one light just wasn't bright enough. Now, when Lewis got the patent for this lamp, he claimed that it was 
twice, twice as efficient as the lamps that they were using in lighthouses before. It used half as much fuel. And what he was replacing was something called the spider lamp. Okay, so this is what was used in American lighthouses before the Lewis lamp. And basically it was a pan of oil with a bunch of wicks in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so his lamp was better, better than the spider lamp. Um, so he sold his patent to the United States for $20,000. Sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? Well, in today's money, that would be over $450,000. So he sold his patent to the United States. His lamps, uh, but first the government said, well, we need to see if these actually are better than what we're using now. And so they did, they, they did the tests at a couple of lighthouses that were near each other. I think they used Baker's, Baker Island Light off of Salem, and uh, maybe Thatcher's Island in Boston. But they used two lighthouses that were in the Boston area, put the Lewis lamps in one, the spider lamps in another, went out to see in between both of them, and they agreed, yes, the Lewis lamp was a lot brighter than the spider lamp. And so they, they gave them the, the contract, bought the patent, and in addition, they paid him $500 a year for, to maintain the lights in all of America's lighthouses. Okay, so this is now in 1812. So he's, he's, got, he's got the patent, he's got the contract, they're paying him to maintain the lights. Then in 1816, they gave him a contract to sell all of the sperm whale oil that was being used in, in the U.S. lighthouses and um, to maintain the lamps, provide the needed supplies, $1,200 a year to deliver the oil, and $500 a year for other responsibilities. So he was making a ton of money, but not only that, that he, he had told them how much sperm whale oil that he needed, the U.S. provided it, he brought it around to lighthouses, that he was able to keep what he didn't use, and it turned out that his lamps were more efficient than even he thought. <laughs> <laughs> and he ended up in 1816 making another $12,000 on the sperm whale oil that he did not use in the lighthouses. So, but that's not all. So he, also, <laughs> he also built about 80 lighthouses in the United States. So, um, so he and Pleasanton had, had a, a very nice, uh, close, personal, professional relationship because Pleasanton didn't know what he was doing, and Lewis <laughs> kind of knew what he was doing, and um, whenever Pleasanton wanted a bid on a project, Lewis was typically the low bidder. So, so they worked very closely together uh, for most of, of Pleasanton's tenure. Now, one of the only problem is that Lewis was not a very good inventor. He didn't know anything about optics, and his lamps were not at all good. So other than that, it was great, but <laughs> his lamps were better than, than what had been there before, but they really weren't very good because his reflectors weren't the right shape, so they didn't reflect the light properly, and the lenses that he put in front of the lamp were made of green glass that was inches thick, and they, everybody said it made a bad light worse. And in fact, after they installed these lamps in lighthouses, people took the lenses off because it was just even worse than not than having nothing. So, um, so that's nice. All right. So there were um, over time there were plenty of complaints about um, about the lights because they were pretty bad. And while Lewis was busy installing lights all over the eastern shore of the United States. Um, Augustin Fresnel in France was inventing the Fresnel lens, which you've probably all heard about. So the Fresnel lens, um, basically the way it works, um, for those who don't know, is it takes that light which wants to spread out and focus it by using prisms, and in this case mirrors, kind of towards the top and the bottom, to, make, to focus that light into a straight beam and make it way more powerful than it would be otherwise. So, um, so the Fresnel lens was a huge game changer. They started using it in Europe in about 1822, and we are still hobbling along with the Lewis lamps, and now you've got sailors who have been overseas, have seen these great lighthouses, and they're complaining because the American lighthouses are awful, and everybody in the world knows the American lighthouses are awful, and the government is not doing anything about it. 
So finally, in about 1838, Congress says, hey, we've got to at least do a test. So they send over to France, they get two Fresnel lenses, they bring them back over here, and they test them out in um, Twin Lights in New Jersey. And um, they said, yeah, they were pretty impressed. They really you know, gave a great light. Um, but Stephen Pleasanton said, you know, I think they're too expensive. <laughs> so now, which is kind of beside the point, because with a Fresnel lens, you're using one lamp. With a Lewis lantern, you might be using 24 lamps. You know. But you know these guys were friends, and you know Lewis couldn't lose his contracts, and so Pleasanton was like, mm, "Yeah, no, we, we can't do that right now." So it really wasn't until the late 1850s that we actually got uh, Fresnel lenses. I guess it was early 1850s that Congress said, "Okay, it's time. Everybody's got to change over. Let's bring these Fresnel lenses to the United States." And it was about 1856 when we actually first got one um, here in East Ham. So now, then moving, so now we know about Winslow Lewis. Um, he's got a lot to do with the East Ham Lighthouses too, which is kind of why I bring him up. So um, I want to talk a bit about the Boston Marine Society. So the Boston Marine Society was formed in 1742. And it started out as a group of Boston sea captains, and they called it the Fellowship Club. So they you know, wanted to get together and hang out, I guess, and talk about sea captain things. Um, they had monthly dues, and they had a box, and every, every month the, the sea captains would put, put their dollar in the box, and they used that for um, paying to members and their families in the event of distress or death. So it was um, this kind of an insurance policy in case someone died at sea and they would give some money to their family. So in 1754, um, the, the group got a charter to make navigation more safe. So that's kind of always been the goal of the Boston Marine Society, to make navigation more, more safe. And they, they still exist to this day. So in 1809, they changed from the Fellowship Club to the Boston Marine Society. All right, so now in 1837, we have Congress there's been so many lighthouses built, and they're building them all over the place, and everybody's asking for a lighthouse, and they said, okay, we're going to appoint a board of naval commissioners, and we're not giving any more money for lighthouses until these naval commissioners examine the site and determine if you need to have a lighthouse there. So this is just about the time uh, when the people in East Ham are thinking that we want to have a lighthouse. So, um, in 1836, the people of East Ham, because we've had so many shipwrecks um, just right here along Nassau Beach, um, decided that we really need a lighthouse here. Not so much for the ocean-going vessels, because they could see the two lighthouses. They could see the Truro Light, they could see the Chatham Light. But if you're really close to shore in East Ham, the way the Cape is curved, you can't see those other two lighthouses. And so there were a lot of local fishermen who were being lost, who were being killed because there was no lighthouse in East Ham. So the people in East Ham went to Boston. They talked to the folks of the Boston Marine Society and petitioned them for a lighthouse. So a committee from the Boston Marine Society came out to East Ham, looked around and said, yes, we agree, and we recommend that you have three lighthouses at this beach. So um, Boston Marine Society went to Congress and said, you know, we'd like to put three lighthouses at Nassau Beach. Um, contingent on getting the okay from the naval commissioners. They had to have that okay. So, who did they send? They sent Mad Jack Percival. <laughs> <laughs> so, you might have driven by the cemetery here in West Barnesville. It's right there on 6A. Um, Captain John Percival uh, was in the U.S. Navy, and he was famous for commanding um, USS Constitution, Old Ironsides, on a voyage around the world. Uh, that was in his, his later years, but this was one of his jobs, was to go to East Ham and see if we really needed to have a lighthouse here. And he thought it was a good idea to have three lighthouses, and so um, let's do that. So there were some people who um, thought it was maybe not a good idea to have any lighthouses. In fact, one of the um, early keepers, Benjamin H.A. Collins, who went, actually went to Boston to talk to the Marine Society, said he encountered obstinate resistance to the project of building a lighthouse on this coast as it would injure the wrecking business. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
But, um, yeah. So regardless, they did approve um, the lighthouses, and Mr. Percival, Captain Percival came, and he staked out the three lighthouses that would be here on Hawson Beach, and there they are. Um, so why did we have three lighthouses? Well, mostly because there was one lighthouse in Truro, two lighthouses in Chatham. We'll have three lighthouses in East Chatham, again, to, to distinguish lighthouses. Um, it is a little sketch of, of what they were supposed to look like. Um, a little bit different from how they turned out, but it kind of gives you the general idea, and it's, it's a pretty cool little drawing. Um, so, again, there are some, some people who thought, well, lighthouses were a fine idea, but maybe we didn't need three. So, um, fam famously, we've, we've all probably seen this post. This is Edward W. Carpenter, who, um, who came to inspect the lights before they were lit, and um, said, you know, I don't think three lights are at all necessary. And, um, and added, um, I cannot believe that the government will consent to consume 900 gallons of oil, but 300 or 360 will answer every purpose. So he, he came and recommended that even before they lit the lights, that they should go down to just one tower, one light, save a lot of oil. But you have to remember at this time, they're still using whale oil. Now, whale oil is really expensive, and you have to go out and kill whales, which is not a good thing. Um, and there were a lot of people who had the this, this same idea that, you know, it's, it's not for the ocean going boats. Nobody's going to get confused. We really don't need three lights, but regardless, obviously, that they went ahead and they built three lights. Um, right. So they... Um, they bought five acres of land from Benjamin H. A. Collins, whose name you just heard, and he was. They paid one hundred fifty dollars to Collins for his land, and he thought that he might be named lighthouse keeper because he provided the land, and um, ultimately he was. But it wasn't until many years later, because of um, the way the political appointments had to do with um, with giving lightkeepers their job. So. Um, all right. So our friend Winslow Lewis, who now is in, also in the building lighthouses business, um, he sees that Congress <laughs> has appropriated $10,000 to build three lighthouses at Nassau Beach. And he said, well, I can do that for $6,548. <laughs> and so, so, of course, he got the contract because he was the lowest bidder. So what he built was three round brick towers. Each one was 15 feet high. So 15 feet from the base up to the bottom of the lantern, and then the lantern about another seven feet high. Um, these lighthouses were 16 feet in diameter at the bottom and nine feet in diameter at the top. And the light station also included a keeper's house, an outhouse, and a well. Now his team was four masons, two carpenters, three laborers, and a cook, and they built the whole thing in 38 days. <laughs> It might surprise you to hear that they didn't do a very good job. Because <laughs> Winslow, he was an entrepreneur, but he was, he was not a builder. He was not a contractor. He was not an engineer. So they built these lighthouses out of brick, and um, they didn't use, well, let me back up a little bit. So when, when Lewis got the contract to build these lighthouses, uh, the government um, appointed an inspector named David Bryant to kind of keep track of the job and make sure everything was going well. So David Bryant was here and he watched them build from the lighthouses. He watched them pour sand in between the double walls of the lighthouse instead of mortar. Mm -hmm. He watched them lay the bricks, not really forming a bond with the bricks, just kind of haphazardly laying them. And to make matters worse, Lewis decided that he didn't like where Percival had staked out the lighthouses because the land was uneven and he would have to pay more for materials. So he moved the lighthouses closer to the bluff so that he could make them all line up without spending more money for materials. So uh, David Bryant, who was here to oversee the project, when they asked him to sign off on it, he said, I don't think it's a very good job. I can't, I can't sign off on it. So the customs collector called him to Boston and said, you know, what's the problem? He said, I don't think it's very good. And the customs collector said, well, Mr. Pleasanton said it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was the, so that was the end of that. Um, 
Each one of these towers has one of those chandelier arrays with 10 of the Winslow Lewis lamps on it. So here's another picture. It's the same lighthouse. They look really different in the different photos, but they're kind of just two different um, views. So you can see here now this particular photograph was taken after 1875 because the keeper's house, which still exists today, was built in 1875. You can see the original keeper's house, the 1838 keeper's house right there, and of course the three towers. Okay, here's a, a close-up of the keeper's house. Now this keeper's house was built in 1875. This was the, we think, the first house built in this style. So the, um, the government had come up with a plan, plan a blueprint for a keeper's house that ended up being used during the 1870s and 1880s. And this was probably the first one. And then we see that around the area, we've got the one in Stage Harbor, same design. Um, West Chop, it's been updated a little bit, but the same design. Um, that's the one Bob is trying to Eastern Point Lighthouse in Gloucester. And then um, Nobska Light in Woods Hole. Well, Nobska looks a little bit different today because they got a second lighthouse and, or keeper's house, and their keeper's houses are connected. So it looks like a totally different house, but you can see it's the same, the same as ours. So um, one of, one of our, our board members, um, Jared Fulcher, has done a lot of research on the keeper's houses, and he's found um, 21 instances of these lighthouses with uh, 13 of them still standing. So they're all over the place. Um, here's a little floor plan. So they all they have six rooms, so three on the first floor, uh, three bedrooms upstairs. Uh, there was an outhouse, they didn't have their own bathroom. Um, central chimney. So, um, right, here's an 1885 survey. It's just, again, showing the light station. So now we've got the three towers. At the bottom, the original keeper's house. In the middle, the new keeper's house. And at the top, a barn and the head house, various outbuildings. And over here is a little building that has to do with the cable station, which I don't have time to get into today, so we'll move along. Um, just another sketch of this um, survey from 1885 showing, showing the layout um, of the light station. Okay. So, um, even though these towers were not very well built, they did last until 1892. And what happened in 1892 was they just got too close to the edge. So, um, so in 1892, they decided that they needed to replace the, the lighthouse because you couldn't move them. You couldn't pick up a pile of, of bricks and move it back. So they decided to replace them with three wooden lighthouses. So the idea being that a wooden lighthouse would be easier to just pick up and move when it needed, needed to happen. And what I discovered was when they built these wooden lighthouses, they only built them 30 feet to the west of the, the brick lighthouses. <laughs> not, probably not a very smart idea. I mean, they knew knew that the erosion was coming, but, but that's what they did. So, um, so it was 1892, they built the three wooden lighthouses, and sure enough, by 1911, they had to move them. Um, so they, um, okay, and oh, I'm gonna go back here and say, at the same time that they built um, the 1892 lighthouses, they built an oil house. So in the 1800s, Kerosene is starting to become the fuel of choice for lighthouses, and kerosene turns out to be a whole lot more volatile and flammable than the um, lard oil that they had been using in the past. So the Lighthouse Bureau uh, recommended that all land-based lighthouses have an oil house um, on site that would be the only place that they could keep the fuel, because they were keeping the fuel in the tower, in the keeper's house, in the barn, whatever. Um, Probably not a very smart idea. So this is a photo of, of the Nasset um, oil house. And it's got a vent in the top, you know, so the fumes don't build up. And, um, okay, so in 1911, <laughs> um, they, the, again, erosion. In 1911, they decide they need to move the lighthouses back, sure enough. And finally decide that, I guess they didn't need three lighthouses after all. Um, so they took the north and the south towers, set them aside for a bit, and then took the center tower, it was called the beacon by then, they moved it and attached it to the keeper's house, it had a little entryway that connected it to the keeper's house, and they fitted it up with a revolving light. 
I've used a clockwork mechanism so the keeper had to wind up the clockwork. And then, just like a grandfather clock, the chains would come down, causing the light to go around. And they set it up so it would flash three times every 10 seconds. Now, this rotating mechanism made the lighthouse kind of sway a little bit. And so you can almost see on the pictures they attached some guide wires to it. They had to put four guide wires to hold this lighthouse down so that it didn't fall over as, as the light was rotating. <laughs> Um, but they just, it turns out that now light, the lighting technology has improved so much that the new lens, the new light that they put in this lighthouse turned out to be 20 times brighter than the three lights individually combined that it replaced. And plus they were able to, um, to reduce their fuel usage by two thirds and also they didn't need to have the, the second keeper, they had an assistant keeper that, that they got. Um, when they needed some extra help. So, um, so they're saving money going like down to one lighthouse. So, um, and when they installed this lighthouse next to the keeper's house, they put it on a foundation. Now, this is now the first lighthouse that we've had at this location that has a foundation. The original ones didn't have a foundation. The other two wooden lighthouses didn't have a foundation. This one did. And so when you go to the beach and you <laughs> see the foundation, this is 1911 foundation. You can see a very low tide, just down, down from uh, Nasa Light, and I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen it. And it's really interesting to stand there at the foundation and look up, and you can see present-day Nasa Light, and that's over 100 years, and you can just see how much erosion has been and, and how much the lighthouses have been moved. So now we are down to, um, to one lighthouse. I told you they took the other two lighthouses, kind of set them aside, and um, a local homeowner bought them. This is Cummings, and she bought them for $3.50 <laughs> and turned them into a summer cottage on Cable Road. So they took the lanterns off the top. When people come to visit, they always ask, what happened to the lanterns? And the, the answer is that they probably used them in another lighthouse somewhere. Because those uh, Fresnel lenses, which were by now fourth order Fresnel lenses, in 1900 they cost $1,250 a piece, which today would be about $45,000. Oh. So it's, it's not something you just want to give away from the lighthouse. So they, they probably ended up at another lighthouse somewhere else. So uh, Mrs. Cummings had this nice little summer cottage. And later on it was used as a, a dance camp in the summertime. So a ballet teacher came up from from the city and uh, the girls came up and um, stayed in the lighthouses and, um, and had a little ballet camp. So um, now going back to Chatham for a moment. So these are the 1877 lighthouses in Chatham. Again, they still have the, their two lighthouses. Uh, these are cast iron lighthouses uh, with brick linings. And by 1923, that one single wooden lighthouse in East Chatham was starting to get a little bit old. And again, they're trying to get rid of some of these multiple light stations to save money. They weren't using the North Tower in Chatham, so they decided to disassemble it and move it to East Town. So they actually took these rings of cast iron apart, um, probably put it on the truck, and drove it over from uh, Chatham to East Town, reassembled it next to the keeper's house, and put a new brick lining in it. When you go to the Nosset Light today, you'll see it has a yellow brick lining, and the one at Chatham still has its red bricks. So there's a picture of the light station with the brand new 1923 light. And then, of course, in about 1940, they painted the top of it. And, and again, that was to distinguish. That was so in the daytime, um, you could tell that this was, that this was East Town. So, um, looking in, into cast iron lighthouses, I've been trying to find out a little bit about where our cast iron lighthouse comes from. Because it turns out there's many lighthouses in New England that are exactly the same design. Okay. Um, Edgartown Harbor Light, which is brought from Ipswich. Um, Knobster Point Light, exactly the same design. Novel Light, same design. Portsmouth Harbor Light, Race Point. Um, lots of lighthouses that are these stacked cast iron lighthouses. Some of them taller, shorter, because they're modular and you can get as many rings as you wanted to. Um, the people in Knobs say that their lighthouse was made in a foundry in Chelsea. 
I haven't really been able to find out anything about ours. I know that some lighthouses were made in the foundry in South Boston. Um, so I'm still, still trying to, the people in Portsmouth tell me they got theirs from Portland. So, uh, Portland, Maine. So it's, it's still kind of a mystery. Um, I'm not so sure about the Chelsea connection, because I know there's a depot in Chelsea, and I'm thinking maybe that's, their lighthouse came through Chelsea. But it's, it remains a mystery, at least um, to me. So, um, all right. So now when they have brought the cast iron lighthouse from Chatham, now they get, they get rid of the beacon, because they don't need this, this one solitary lighthouse anymore. So they sell it to another homeowner, Mr. Albert Hall. And Mr. Hall builds himself a little cottage by the beach. He gets to keep the lantern room in his lighthouse, but there's no light in it. But he's, he gets to keep that lantern structure, which is kind of cool, which is why that one that we have today has this lantern room. Okay. So um, when the National Park came in 1960, they realized that they had this kind of unique treasure because this is the only surviving triple light station in the United States. So in 1965, they bought the um, two lighthouses that were owned by the Cummings family, they were not in very good shape by then. Here's what they looked like in 1985. They demolished the structure that had been in between. And then in, 1970, in 1975, they bought the third lighthouse back from the family of Mr. Hall. And during the 1980s, they fixed them all up. It was a lot of work. It cost about $500,000. And they reunited them in this park that's about 1,800 feet from current Nasset Lake. People always want to know why they're back in the woods. And um, part of the reason is um, some people had wanted to put the restored lights you know, back on the shore. Uh, but that would be a problem because continuing erosion, parking issues. Um, the National Seashore wanted these lighthouses to go to the Marconi area. But the East Ham Historical Society um, balked at removing the historical treasures. And so they, they ended up here in East Ham. All right, so moving on, everything is going along pretty great until about 1993, <laughs> when again, um, erosion, and we find our lighthouse very close to the edge. Well, the Coast Guard says, I know this is going to be familiar to a lot of you, the Coast Guard decides we don't really need this lighthouse anymore. We're going to dismantle it, decommission it, and um, say goodbye. So, of course, Everybody in East Cam got all fired up and said, we need to save the lighthouse and formed the Nosset Light Preservation Society to try to save the lighthouse. So here's a picture that was in uh, the Cape Cotter, showing 1961, 1966, showing how much erosion has happened in 35 years. Pretty dramatic. Wow. Um, and so, of course, as we all know, um, it was successful. In November of 1996, the lighthouse was moved. Uh, it's a relatively small lighthouse, weighs only 90 tons, so they were able to pick it up and put it on a truck and drive it across the street in one day. Um, they also moved the oil house at the same time, and then two years later, they moved the keeper's house. So now um, the light station is reunited. We have this really interesting erosion graph that people like to look at when they visit uh, the Three Sisters. So it shows that yellow dotted line was the coastline in 1890. Or, um, yeah, 1890. And you see the Three Sisters out there in the water. That's where they were located when they were built in 1892. And then you can just see the different lines. You've got 1960, 2009, 2018, and um, now we've got the three sisters back in the woods, and you can see where Nosset Light has been moved. And um, you probably know that they've moved that, that road that used to run from the lighthouse, Nosset Light Beach Road, and now it's right here. And I just noticed the other day when I was at the lighthouse, they have gone ahead and they're building a road that comes around the north to the lighthouse, and they've already like, cleared that land. So that's pretty exciting for us at the lighthouse. Um, but um, as we all know, erosion continues. Erosion is accelerating. And um, people say, well, when are you going to have to move the lighthouse again? And probably, I would say, 30 to 40 more years before we have to move the lighthouse. So um, 
Right, so that is uh, pretty much what I have to say. Um, I want to give time for some questions. Anybody has a question?